sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. I need to apologize. The words I've emailed have obviously changed this morning. The next verse is, Hither to thy love has blessed me. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast drawn me to this place, and I know thy hand will lead me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy display you sang I don't really know whether to do the next song just I brought my red pen let's pray Father, I thank you for, Lord, this first day of the week. Lord, that we can gather in your Son's name. Lord, I thank you that today, of all days, we can come before you again. And we can examine ourselves, Lord, in the light of your glory. And Lord, if there's anything wrong in us, Lord, I pray you would show us. Lord, I pray you would remind us to confess all that doesn't bring you honor and glory. The sin in our lives, Lord, that separate us from you, Lord. We ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the country and around the world that are suffering today through the circumstances that they're in, Lord. Lord, remind us just how blessed we are, Lord, that we can gather here freely without fear of oppression, suffering. Remind us of that, Lord, and help us never to take that for granted. Father, as we bring this offering before you, Lord, we ask for your blessing upon it. Lord, may it be used for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil Rushing away.
pray that your Holy Spirit might rush through the sanctuary this morning, blowing out the dust of our lives, Lord, that need to be cleansed, so that we might be pure and holy and in fire for you once again. So be with us, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't I turn around, shake someone's hand, and say good morning to them. Okay, I'll run through the announcements uh, before we do anything else. And uh, busy week as always. Uh, tonight we are in 1 Samuel 23, as we continue in the life of David, and we find him in another uh, couple of situations, and we'll find spiritual help from uh, those places. Uh, so tonight, half past six. Tomorrow night, guys, uh, our men's ministry begins a series. Uh, don't know how long it will take in spiritual gifts. Um, it just didn't happen by chance. It was to be a one-off uh, look at these a uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, I think the Lord was showing very clearly that it's an area that the guys need to uh, rise to, is to be used by God, stirring up the gifts uh, that are within them. And so we're going to look at spiritual gifts tomorrow night, and, uh, and do encourage you to come along. Uh, Tuesday morning, the toddler group, and then the musicians' fellowship in the evening, Salt and Light at 8 o'clock. Wednesday, the prayer meeting in Hamilton Home Fellowship in the evening. Uh, Thursday, we continue study in John chapter 12, uh, and at the same time, there is the youth ministry, and then on Friday, the coffee morning. I don't know if we can take too much more of the coffee mornings. I mean, it was absolutely mobbed on Friday. I don't know whether it was just because it was Valentine's Day, but, uh, you know, you kind of die all week thinking you're beginning to make progress, and then you show up at a coffee morning, and uh, there are so many things there uh, to entice you. But uh, we look forward to uh, that again this coming Friday. Now, if you've got a bulletin, you'll see that uh, in a few weeks' time, uh, almost a month's time, uh, on the 13th of March, we're going to show uh, a documentary about the revival man, uh, Jock Troop. Uh, some of you will know the name, others won't know the name. Uh, he was uh, very influential in the mid-20th uh, century in Glasgow with the Tent Hall uh, and other places, and uh, he truly had a, a phenomenal ministry, but as always, the idea of showing the documentary is not to glorify the man, but is to challenge us to uh, the type of man or woman that God can use. Uh, I was sharing on Thursday and again this morning with my mother. I think one of the incredible statements that's brought out in the movie is uh, by a man who's probably in his 70s or 80s, but 
uh, he'd been around uh, when Jock Troop uh, was in Fraserburgh, and uh, he was a child at the time, or maybe a young teenager. And his lasting memory was the fact that uh, uh, Jock Troop was a great man of prayer. And he'd been at a prayer meeting, and there was Jock Troop lying on his back with his hands in the air. And he thought this a bit strange, uh, but he also had a dilemma because his mother told him that when you go to a prayer meeting, you keep your eyes closed. So how could he tell his mother that he had seen this man lying on his back with his hands in the air praying? But curiosity got the better of him, so he kind of bit the bullet and asked his mother. And it turned out that he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees were so sore that he had to lie on his back. Now, I find that extremely challenging. I mean, how often do we spend time on our knees to the point where they ache and uh, no longer? And I think a prayer life like that, it's not surprising that God used them in such a mighty way. So uh, whether you've heard of them or not, I think you'll be challenged uh, by just uh, the principles of what God can do through a man who's sold out to him. But let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 uh, this morning. Uh, difficult chapter for us. And I'll explain why in a second. First uh, Timothy chapter 5. The reason it's a difficult chapter is because it really doesn't need any explanation. You know, when we're teaching the Bible, for example, tonight when we're uh, in First Samuel and over the past few weeks, uh, we could take a theme like the different places where uh, that were important in the life of David, the Valley of Elah where he fought Goliath, uh, Nob where he uh, went to run from Saul, uh, Gath where Goliath came from. Tonight we'll see uh, Ziph and En Gedi and other places. And it's easy to look and say, well, we can build a, an expositional study on these things and the principles that we can discover to apply in our life. Uh, even in the life of Paul, you can say, well, we can look at Paul's prayers in the New Testament, or we can look at Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, and I don't mean it's easy, but it's easier to be able to uh, sit down and look at these things and teach them expositionally, uh, where we can uh, go line up and line, precept up and precept, here a little, there a little. But as much as I admire the Apostle Paul, he frustrates me at times. Because in a chapter like this, he gives us almost 20 or 30 one-liners, and they're not up for debate. You know, when he says things, it's not as if you say, well, we need a pastor or a theologian or somebody to explain these things. They're so blatantly one-liner, obvious, that it boils down to, will we do them or will we not do them? And so we'll be finished in 10 minutes. <laughs> Chance would be a fine thing. Uh, Graham was going on about the fact that there was a little bit of confusion over, uh, you know, come thou fountain of every blessing. Uh, every time we sing that song, it's not as confusing as I find it because uh, for those of us who are more spiritual, we know that uh, these modern uh, hymn writers changed verse 2 uh, because most people don't have a clue what verse 2 is about. But verse 2 begins, Here I raise my Ebenezer. And... Uh, we don't sing that anymore. It's hitherto the Lord has helped us, which is exactly the same thing. That's what the word Ebenezer means. And uh, it brought back this morning as we were singing it, the fact that, you know, all these years ago uh, when I was born, uh, my mother and father had an argument. And the argument was over whether he was going to be called Ebenezer or David. Thankfully, my mother won. Might have been the only time in her entire life she won in an argument with my father, but uh, I'm glad she did. But at the same time, you know, I can understand the sentiment and the thought behind that wonderful word, Ebenezer. And we're going to consider, as we look at these one-liners this morning, uh, the church of Jesus Christ, the family of God more than anything else. Now, we've been here in Motherwell for uh, 33 years or thereabouts, and we could say, Ebenezer. Hitherto, or up until this point, so far, the Lord has helped us. And as we look through this passage, we'll realize that, you know, that is why the church is gathered together. And God will help those 
who are committed to the Word of God and doing things the way God wants them to do. And there's no more greater chapter about family life within the church than this one. When I was younger, I had a, a daughter who was quite young. She was probably only about eight or nine at the time. And uh, of course, every uh, Christian dad wants their child to grow up to be a spiritual uh, you know, man or woman. And she was about maybe eight or nine years old, and we were having one of our father-daughter conversations, and she said that when she grew up, she wanted to be a missionary. And I thought, that's an awesome concept. And then she added, on a desert island. You know, well, in case you haven't worked it out, there's no people in a desert island. Uh, I think she thought Hawaii or somewhere like that would have been good. But that reminds me of a story where there was a man who'd spent some time on a desert island, right in the middle of the ocean, and uh, ships had gone by all the time. But eventually, uh, he lit a fire, and uh, they noticed that the ship came over. And uh, when they got onto the island, uh, although he was all by himself, they noticed there were three buildings. And that kind of puzzled them. What would any man need three buildings for? And so those who rescued him said, can you explain what these are? He says, well, that's no problem. He says, the first one is my house. And he thought, well, that's quite cool. And what about the second one? He says, uh, that's the church. And I thought, that's really good. And he says, what about the third one? He says, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, we can fall out with church, even almost within ourselves. But despite all its faults, the church is still the greatest hope for the world. And every Sunday when I look out in the congregation here, it never ceases to amaze me that there is potential here for positive change in our communities, within our families. This group of people that gather together who have covenanted together to become devoted followers of Christ is more important than any social or business organization because we have the privilege that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And there is great potential there. But you know, the church cannot play with the rules of the world if it's going to be blessed and used by God. There are pillars within the church. We're not going to talk about these in detail this morning, but I'll share them with you. A healthy church, a healthy family, puts God first. And that's a desire here at Calvary more than anything else, is to ensure that everything is done, Jesus Christ is preeminent in all these things, more than anything else. But secondly, a healthy family also has a specific structure. It's not chaos. Paul talks about doing all things decently and in order, and we strive to do these things. The third thing is that a healthy family or church cares about the whole group. And that's one of the things, again, that blesses me about this group of people. We have not only our Sunday morning and our Sunday night and our Thursday night, but we have various groups whereby the family of God can show that they care for one another, be with one another, fellowship with one another. You've got your women's fellowship, which comprises of younger women and older women. They come together, again, centered around the Word of God, centered around the worship of God, and centered around fellowship with one another. That's why these things are important. We have the men's fellowship, where guys, again, young and old, can get together, can fellowship together, worship together, study the Word together, get to know each other. You've got the different koinonia groups, whether it's Salt and Light or Fusion or Hamilton Home Fellowship, the youth ministry on a Thursday. They're all designed for the family to get together, but they can show that they care for one another. And this chapter is going to explain how we can care about the whole church. And then the fourth pillar would be that healthy family sticks together in all circumstances. And we'll develop that as we consider this thing and as we get through these one-liners. Paul has written to Timothy, and you know by this time, as we've studied it in chapter 1, it's all about the church and her message. He mentions the law of God and the gospel, and it's about the church and the message. Chapters 2 and 3, it's about the church and her members. And although there were some controversial points there, that's what it was all about. 
Last week when we were in chapter 4, in the last couple of weeks, it was about the church and her ministers. And by ministers, I don't mean the reverends or the pastors or the priests or the whatever it might be, because we know that you are the ministers of God's grace to one another and to the world outside. The word minister just means to serve, and a church should be a serving church. And so we gathered together, and we saw in chapter 4, there were three things about a true minister of Jesus Christ. And it applies to everyone, that they should be good, they should be godly, and they should be growing. We should never be standing still as we move through in a Christian life. But as we get to chapters 5 and 6, we're going to see the church and our ministry, our service, what does the church do? In, in chapter 5, it's all about ministry to itself. When we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the family of God, how do we conduct ourselves? And Paul has given us this series of one-liners of uh, do's, things that need to be there. And as I say, they're, they're not controversial. Uh, it's just down to whether we decide that we're going to follow Paul's instruction or, or not. And then in chapter 6, next week, we'll round off First Timothy, and we get into the church's ministry uh, to the world. And so we'll see that. Last week in chapter 4, we were told to stand for truth. We were told to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Remember, you be an example of the believer in word and faith and purity and so on. And also, take heed to your ministry. That's how Paul finished in verses 12 through 16. Take heed to your ministry. You may want to look at it just one more time, these last four verses. It says, Let no one despise your youth, but you be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. Until I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, and do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate in these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And then he goes straight into what we know as chapter 5. It's essential to remember, as we constantly remind you, there were no chapter divisions in the Bible when it was written. These didn't come in until the 12th century to make it easier to look up Scripture. And so there was no real break, and Paul is just going to move in to this uh, sign of the things that should be there as we minister to one another. Do you remember the time when Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Now, the Jews had 613 commandments. That's quite a lot to remember. But in Mark's account of that, Jesus replies and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then he goes on and tells them the second commandment. The second is like this, namely, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, there is none other greater commandment than these. And so, the Jews had 613 commandments. Jesus boils them down to two that we can easily remember. And as we consider the family of God, you know why we gather together. The first one is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. That is why we focus everything in this sanctuary on the worship of God. We worship Him through the psalm, through prayer, through singing, through the Word of God. We worship through our giving. It's all about the worship of God. That's the greatest commandment. He says, worship Him with your mind. That means every thought. Worship Him with your heart, every pure motive. And worship, worship Him, and I love this word, with your soul, every emotion. I like music, and I like different types of music. There's, in fact, there's only one type of music. If you've been here any length of time, you know the only type of music you don't like is country and western, right? That's of the devil, right? No offense to anybody. But, you know, I love soul music. I love the whole idea of soul music. And that's about every emotion. And when we gather together to worship God with our mind, every thought, with our heart, every pure motive, with our soul, 
every emotion. To come here on a Sunday morning or Sunday night or whenever we gather together just to feel that outpouring of love for Jesus Christ. But he said, you also need to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, of course, the question was asked, who is my neighbor? And without you know, digressing too much, we have neighbors within the church. Those who are sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, and all around. These are our neighbors, and we're encouraged to love one another. And next week we'll see we're encouraged to love our neighbors who are in the world. Because we will show God's love to the world through our ministry, through our service for Jesus Christ. We're called to be godly representatives. Now, this is our church home. Even if you're visiting this morning, you're still a member of the family of God if you belong to Jesus Christ. And so, welcome to the family. But think about church family. Think about the word family. We need to behave like a family behaves. Now, I know that's a dangerous thing to say because you might be saying, oh, you don't know my family. You don't want to behave like that. No, I'm thinking how it should be. But what is a family? A family is something that's together because of a blood relationship. And we are gathered together in this place because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the one thing that unifies each one of us. You may come from this country. You might be a visitor from another country. Um, you may be male, female, old, young, rich, poor. doesn't matter. If you put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, accepted his forgiveness and become born again, you have received the cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been born into the family of God. And you've all heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. And so as we gather here this morning, we are the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Paul is going to talk in this chapter about how we treat each other within the family of God. And there are going to be, uh, you know, dads, moms, brothers, sisters, widows, leaders, and so on. All these things will be taken care of. But don't forget the ultimate instruction of what Paul is saying is so that our love for one another, our unity as brothers and sisters in Christ will be a witness to those outside of the church. They will realize there's something special about the family of God. They were different from the world outside. And yet, if we're honest, so often the world outside looks at the church today in the sea of family, that always seems to be bickering and fighting and arguing and disagreeing and these things. And Paul puts these things here so that we are not like that. Now, you might say, perhaps easier said than done. Don't forget the word says they will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. It doesn't say we'll be known as his disciples because, because we come to a church building or because we sing certain songs or because we have all these fellowship nights or concerts or movie nights or whatever it might be. The world out there will know that we are disciples by the love that we have for one another. Love is the greatest thing that God has given to the body of Christ. It doesn't matter how technologically advanced we are or how big the band or the choir or anything else is or how our services are designed. The ultimate litmus test of where we are as a family will be seen through the love that we have for one another. I'm going to give you some scriptures this morning uh, they're all from the, the New English Standard Version. But in Hebrews, it says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. In Romans, it says, Love one another with brotherly affection. And I love this, outdo one another and showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. 
In Colossians, Paul writes, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Do you remember the incident in Jesus' life where, you know, they were talking about, you know, the fact that he didn't have a father, you know, they're questioning his legitimacy and, uh, you know, how he had almost, it seems, neglected his mother, which he hadn't done, but that was the interpretation. And Jesus turned towards the disciples and we read in Matthew 12, stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In other words, that's my family, the family of God. Acts 2, you know it very well. The early church would gather together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayers, and awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any that had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received the food with glad and generous hearts. And I could go on, there's a number of other verses I've got down here, but the whole thing is the early church knew that they were the family of God. They looked out for one another. They cared for one another. They did everything they possibly could to grow together as the family of God with Jesus Christ as the head of the church. And so that's why Paul is talking here about the ministry of the church. What do we do? And as I say, this is a nightmare chapter to try and, you know, you know spin out for 45 minutes. So the good thing is we probably won't because it's not up for debate. And I'm glad he starts in verse 1 by saying, do not rebuke an older man. Now, I'm not saying I'm an older man, right? In fact, I'm young at heart. If you're 15 and somebody is 16, they're an older man to you, okay? But he says very clearly, and I don't know how we can try and, you know, debate over this thing. Paul makes it very clear, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort or encourage him as a father. Do not rebuke an older man. In Leviticus 19.32, it says, You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God, for I am the Lord. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Now, we're living in an age where it's not politically correct to uh, you know, speak against same-sex marriages or couples or anything else. But I thought I'd look up some definitions, not biblical definitions, right? Legal definitions, you know, dictionary definitions. Yeah, I'm not homophobic, but listen to a secular definition of what a father is. A father is a male parent who has raised a child, supplied the sperm through sexual intercourse or sperm donation which grew into a child and or donated a body cell which resulted in a clone. Now, what do you need to be able to do that, dads? You need a woman to fulfill the legal definition of a father. But anyway, do not rebuke an older man. Treat him as you would treat your dad. Now, I know that some of us, and I, I say that generically because, you know, I love my dad to bits, but, you know, see, some of us have not had good experiences with our dads. But don't let that put you off. We'll come back to that in a second. But dads generally need to be treated with dignity. One of my father's great expressions, and I can never understand it, was gray hairs grow wisdom. Now, he told me that before he had gray hair right enough. But gray hairs grow wisdom. And we should respect older men within the body of Christ, that as they get older, their wisdom, their walk with the Lord can give so much to us. And so quite simply, Paul says, treat them with dignity and respect. Don't be a rebel without a cause. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the older men in the church will be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But show respect, show dignity. And then it says, treat the younger men as brothers. When I think of brothers, I think of honesty. I think you've been able to relate to them and tell them virtually anything. In fact, you can probably tell your brothers more than you can tell your mom and dad when you're grown up. But there is that honesty amongst brothers. The idea between brothers is that you love them no matter what. Why? Because you've got the same parents. You know, growing up, you know, there's a bit of an age gap between me and my brothers, but, uh, you know, if, if you get brothers and you're around about the same age, you're going to stick together. And you might have your arguments, you might have your fights now, but when anybody outside the family gets involved, generally speaking, the brothers stick together. Why? Because they've got the same parents. And as brothers in Christ, we stick together because we have the same Heavenly Father. We're gone, born again by the Spirit of God. Then it says, treat the older women as mothers. Isn't that one of the greatest words that has ever been invented? A mother. Um, you know, when you think of mothers, again, I know you can't go straight across the board, but generally speaking, you know, dads can be a bit of a pain at times. But where would we be without our mothers? And again, it needs respect. We need to consider them. We need to regard them. And again, it's the family attitude. You know, the mothers are the ones who would care for you, dress you, clean you, and, uh, you know, when your dad was out working. And Paul says, treat the older women in the church with that kind of respect. Consider them. Regard them. They've got a lot to put into church life. Then it says, treat the younger women as sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ Sisters, what do you do with them if you're a brother? Oh, you fight with them, you pull their pigtails, and you do all these things. Now, I don't know if many of you know, I've actually got a sister. I know that you've never seen her. No, it's because she lives half the world away. But I've got a sister, and we would fight like cat and dog when we were growing up. But let me tell you, I protected her. And I would protect any sister. And isn't that the idea of what Paul is saying when we think of brothers and sisters in Christ? Brothers, be honest with one another. Stick together, encourage one another, build one another up. But guys, for the sisters in the church, protect them. Shield them. And it says there, with all purity. Now this <laughs> might be a difficult thing to say, but you know, take it from a heart of love, right? Guys, you don't come to church to eye them up and see if you can take them out. That might develop, that might happen somewhere down the line. The prime thing is, don't treat them like a future girlfriend. Treat them like a sister. Respect them as far as purity is concerned. Don't forget, she is the bride of Christ. She's the bride of Christ, just like we all are as the church. And there needs to be that understanding and protecting and standing by these. So Paul goes into them. And as I say, maybe you haven't got a brother or a sister, perhaps not even a father that you know or a mother. But you know, this is a great thing about the family of God. If you need a father, a mother, a sister, or a brother figure, Paul says they're within the church. Respect the older men. Respect the women. Respect the brothers in Christ. Respect the sisters in Christ. They will never replace your earthly family, but we're gathered together here as a heavenly family for the future. Now he goes on from verse 5 to 16, sorry, verse 3 to 16, and he's talking about widows. And it's very tempting to spend a great deal of time on this. And you know, for those of you who are widows in here this morning, because I'm not spending too much time on it, don't think that it doesn't matter. But again, Paul makes it abundantly clear that there's no ambiguity on these things. Let's read it from verse 3 and see what Paul says. <coughs> Honor widows who are really widows. If any widow has children or grandchildren, 
Let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. In other words, Paul says very clearly, it's not up for debate. If you've got children and grandchildren and you're a widow, they have the responsibility to care for you. Now, verse 5, she who is really a widow and left alone, she's no other family. Someone who is trusting in God continues in prayers and supplications night and day. She should be considered for help from within the body of Christ. It says, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. In other words, if she's alone and she just decides that she's going to have a good time and enjoy life and put the past behind her, Paul says, you need to consider the amount of effort that you're putting behind supporting them. Now, don't forget, this was a cultural thing very much regarding Ephesus. They didn't have state benefits in those days and other ways of being able to contribute and hope. It says, these things command that they may be blameless. And if anyone doesn't provide for his own, that's children and grandchildren, and especially for those of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Don't let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she's been the wife of one man. Now they had, when it says taken into the number, they obviously had a list in those days of the widows, and the church would do everything they could to be benevolent and to help and to support and do these things. And of course, it doesn't matter what age a widow is, but Paul is saying, you know, when they get to 60, they're probably not going to get married again. Um, you know, the, the children will be up and taking care of their own lives and everything else. She should also be the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she's brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if she's washed the saints' feet, if she's relieved the afflicted, if she's diligently followed every good work. In other words, for those genuinely committed people to the body of Christ, to her widows, the church has a responsibility to take care for them. Don't forget what James said in James chapter 1, the very last verse I think it is. It says, pure and genuine religion is this, that you visit the orphans and the widows. Take care of those who are in need. But Paul says, refuse the younger widows, because when they have grown, begun to grow wanton against Christ, they have a desire to marry again having condemnation because they've cast off their first faith. And beside, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, and give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. In other words, Paul is saying, if somebody has gone through the tragic experience of losing a loved one, Paul opens the door and says, you know, that they you know, have every entitlement if they want to get married and have children and, and do these things. He says, but some of them have already turned aside to Satan. They were just leaving the church in Ephesus. And again, if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened so that it may relieve those who are really widows. Quite a mouthful to go through this, but I mean, it's, it's very clear. There's no ambiguity. There's no great need for deep teaching. All I would say is the principles here apply to general benevolence within the church. You know, for example, we have a homeless ministry where people who are homeless can come and can get food. But quite often we get uh, homeless people uh, who are not really homeless, uh, but they claim to be homeless, who've got a wife and kids um, and all this. You know, and Paul is saying you need to use great wisdom. When people are in genuine need, the church is there to support them, particularly within the church. But there needs to be wisdom in these things. I mean, you would not believe sometimes the hassles that we have. We give food to people and uh, they have a look in the bag and what they don't like, they toss over the wall there before they even get to the front gate. And it's a well-known fact that quite often we give them a stack of food and what they do is go and sell it so they can get money for drugs. And so Paul is saying there needs to be a, an understanding, a prayerful consideration of who are genuinely in need. Talking about the widows here, that is the key phrase. It's those who are in need. And he talks about those who are indulgent rather than dependent. 
the qualifications here of maturity, fidelity, and charity. He's talking about age and attitude, and these things are important. And so, as I say, we could spend some time looking at examples of other benevolent ministries, but the same principles apply. Your families have this first responsibility to care for those who are in need. But great wisdom and discernment is needed through these things. And then finally, the last number of verses here is talking about within the family of God, uh, leadership. And he says in verse 17, let the elders who rule well, and that's the key phrase, rule well, be counted worthy of double honor. And that word honor is where we get the word honorarium from, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. The early church knew that God's word had made it very clear that those who were involved in ministry should be supported by those who were within the family of God. Let me give you some exact examples in Acts chapter 28. You remember Paul was in Malta and it happened that the father, father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed. He laid hands on him and healed him. So that was Paul as an elder, a pastor, a missionary doing things well on behalf of the Lord. And because of that, when this was done, the rest of those in the island who had diseases came and were healed and they honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Now, the reason I pulled out that verse is because there are many people today in ministry that just want provided for and don't want to do any work for it. You know, you know all about the TV evangelists have their private jets and their white suits and their fancy cars and their mansions and their swimming pools and everything else. Paul's going to talk in various places about those who are ruling well, doing well in ministry, taking care of the people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, it's written in the law of Moses, and of course he quotes that later on here, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it for our sakes? He says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, Paul says, we have not used this right, but we endure all things. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Now, this isn't an appeal from, this is a difficult passage to teach on, right? But the way I see it, Paul is saying, you know, there is a responsibility within the family of God to maintain those who minister to you. Now, I don't think it's just talking about pastors, although he mentions elders ruling well and so on. I think if people are ministering well to you, you should always look out for their needs. And, you know, it's a reciprocal thing. Galatians 6, 6, let him who's taught in the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And again, the emphasis is on being taught the word. You'll go many places where you won't be taught the word. You'll be entertained, you know. We're not called to entertain the goats, but to feed the sheep. And there are many churches today that just want to entertain the congregation. And if you want entertainment, can I recommend that you skip churches? I don't, I don't mean stop going to church. I rephrase that. If you want entertainment, go to the SECC or you know, some of these places. You'll get good quality entertainment. The problem with the church is that they're, they're kind of faking it as they go along. And they're trying to grow churches through you know, their, their, their entertainment programs so that you feel good when you leave. That's not the purpose of church. I mentioned earlier that DVD that we're going to show about Jock Troop. Tent Hall, every week, every weekend, two and a half thousand people. That's a mega church. And they never entertained. They fed 1,500 people on a Sunday morning, 1,500 homeless people on a Sunday morning, a hot breakfast. Which meant that the family of God had to be there to get involved in providing 1,500 people with a hot breakfast. In the afternoon, and I know that times were different uh, when I was young. In the afternoon, they fed 800 deprived children, 800 deprived children a Sunday lunch. 
And again, it took the people of the congregation to do it. They weren't there to entertain. They didn't build a church of 2,600 to entertain the people, but to get the people together to pray, to minister to those who were in need. And if they wanted entertainment, they could go elsewhere. It was built in prayer and service. And so the idea is, if you're taught in the Word, you know, that's the key. Not just if you're entranced by something else. And Paul, again, in First Thessalonians uh, 5, and in Hebrews 13, talks about the same things. Verse 18 Scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. What is, from this side of the pulpit, what our attitude, attitude should be to being in ministry? And if God calls you into full-time ministry, what should your attitude be? Just think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 to his disciples. These 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Don't go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. And then it says, Freely you have received. Freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver, nor copper in your money belts. Don't take a bag for your journey. Don't take two coats, two pairs of sandals, two staffs. And whatever city you, or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. In other words, Jesus is saying, the heart of a minister is not to fleece the sheep. It's to feed the sheep, protect the sheep, provide for the sheep, and to do these things. And unfortunately, I think we live in a day and age where there is a lack of young men coming through in the ministry because we live in such a commercial world. You know, they, they need good salaries and big houses and all these things. Jesus says, listen, if you're going to be involved in ministry, keep it as simple as you possibly can. You don't need a lot. And so you need to balance that with what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, if people teach you, if they rule well, make sure you take care of them. But from the other side, those who are doing these things, don't fleece the flock. He says in verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Very simple, doesn't need explanation. Don't listen to the gossip. Get your facts right. Witnesses are important. There are many ministries that have been destroyed by gossip. Witnesses, you know what witnesses, somebody who actually sees something. The Paul says, make sure there are two or three. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all. That's scary. Okay. Next Sunday morning we'll have a rebuking in the presence of all service, right? And between now and next Sunday morning, I'll make a list of your sins and I'll tell everybody here in the church. That's not what Paul is saying. It's got to be balanced with Matthew 18, where if you have something against a brother or sister, you go to them first of all. Jesus gives the procedure. But if someone is going to be so hard-hearted and unwilling to repent and change their life, Paul says you need to stand up and just let everybody know. Now, thankfully, in 33 years, we've never had to do it. And I'm nearly retired, so hopefully we've never got to do it. But I know that it's been done in churches, and it's not an easy thing to do. But you need to balance that with don't listen to gossip. But if the sinning is obvious, make sure that it doesn't go unchecked. And we have that issue of accountability. It says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. You know, favoritism in a family is always dangerous, as you know, and as I know. 
And Paul says, within this family, his brothers and sisters, all their men and all their women, as we gather together, make sure there's no favoritism, no cliques, no little clubs, no little groups, you know, no favoritism. Do everything together as a one another to the body of Christ. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Now, that doesn't mean punch them quickly, you know. It means ordain them. Don't do it hastily and don't share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Essentially, what he's saying here is, and we don't have time, but you could go to Acts chapter 6, don't raise anyone up in leadership. Watch their lives and their involvement. You know, there's so many people today in the 21st century church want hands laid on them for a position. And the attitude is, I will not get involved until you do it. Paul says, no, that's not the way to do it. Watch their lives. See if they get involved. See how they serve. See how they minister. See what their heart's like. And then when you see the involvement, then you can ordain them into the ministry. Give them a position, not the other way around. It says, don't share in people's sins. Best understanding of that is Second John where he says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. In other words, if there are those who are straying from the gospel and the law of God, don't endorse what they're doing. Stay back from them and keep yourself pure. It's interesting. Verse 23 is perhaps the most talked about verse in this chapter. Not by ourselves, but everybody wants to debate this chapter. They don't want to debate whether you respect an older man or treat a younger woman as your sister or, you know, how you handle, you know, your leadership and that. They want to argue about this one. No longer drink only water. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Isn't it amazing? This is always the verse people zoom into, you know. What about temperance? You know, should it be abstinence? That's between you and the Lord. But there's an interesting thing here that you should ask yourself. Why didn't Paul just pray for Timothy's healing? Why did he tell me to go and take a glass of wine? If Paul was so opposed to moderation, because he does say in Ephesians, don't get drunk with wine if we're in his excess. But why did Paul not then just say, Timothy, I know you've got a stomach problem. Um, you know, Christians here in Ephesus, I can't recommend that you take a glass of wine for your stomach, so, you know, we'll just pray about it. You need to think these things through. Now, it is a controversial issue. And all I can say is it's between you and the Lord. Paul here tells Timothy, take wine for your stomach's sake. He doesn't say take it for a leisure time activity or to relieve stress or anything like that. He says, you know, it's medicinal and take some. It's interesting, Timothy had frequent infirmities and yet he was never healed through the prayers of Paul or anyone else. Some men's sins, verse 24, are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment and those follow it later. In other words, it's blatantly obvious with some people's sins. But you know, ultimately, as it says in the book of Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out. You might get away with it for a while, but ultimately you'll get caught up. But likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So, difficult chapter to really expound and expand. They're all one-liners. And if we just read through it again in the leisure, uh, our own leisure time at home and just see these, you know, things, they're very self-explanatory and things that we can do to maintain the welfare of the family of God. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word again and we pray that we might give heed to these things that have been written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by your Holy Spirit for the good of the family of God. As fathers, as older women, as brothers, sisters, leaders, widows. Lord, help us to 
maintain the depth of a bond of love between one another. Help us to meditate on these things, to apply these things within our family life here at Calvary so that the world outside might know that we are your disciples by the love that we have for one another. Lord, go with us till we meet again because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.